but it was against our principle of accessibility. Our motto is accessibility through affordability and technology. And I can one day say, no, 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 uh, we will accept only <laughs> because everything in higher education is uh, uh, you get your reputation by denying students. <laughs> Hi, this is Dr. Jed McCosco at Wake Forest University and Academic Influence. And today coming to us from Georgia Tech is Professor G. Galil, okay? And uh, he is a professor of computer science and has taught a huge class that has made computer science available at the master's level to so many people. So I wanna find out a little bit about that today, but first, tell us where you're from originally. We can hear that you have an accent and uh, how did you end up at Georgia Tech? What was your tra trajectory? It's a very long story, but I, I try to be uh, succinct. Uh, I was born in Israel, actually in mandatory Palestine that preceded Israel. And uh, I went to Tel Aviv University, uh, BA and MA and went to Cornell to do a PhD and a postdoc at IBM, and then I went to, back to Tel Aviv University, was on the faculty. Then I was at Columbia University for 25 years uh, as, a, as a professor, then as chairman, as, and, and then dean of engineering. And then I went uh, uh, back to Tel Aviv University to be the president of Tel Aviv University, and I was president for a little over two years and stepped down. That's a long story, not for today. And then Georgia Tech called, and I became, uh, they asked me to be a candidate, uh, actually a finalist for the dean position at uh, Georgia Tech. And uh, I was dean of engineering uh, for nine years. I stepped down in June of 2019 and went back to the faculty after two terms. Wow. Well, that was very succinct. And we can kind of imagine you going between uh, the two countries, the United States and Israel, and building up your expertise in uh, being an administrator and working with people. But how did that lead to this giant master's level computer science class that you're now teaching? So I always was concerned about uh, affordability and accessibility of higher education. And it all started in uh, actually 2012. Uh, Sebastian Tran, uh, uh, who was the founder of Udacity, uh, visited Georgia Tech. And 2012 was called by the New York Times the year of the MOOC. That's when the MOOC arrived. Massive open online courses. And the first one was actually by Tran uh, uh, and somebody else at Google, uh, artificial intelligence, but he created the a, a startup called Udacity that was, provided the, the, a platform for MOOCs. Same time that also called Sarah, another one, uh, started later, edX joined them. So these are the three first ones. And he, uh, he suggested uh, to consider uh, starting uh, a master degree that will be based on MOOCs. And I like the idea immediately. You know, the MOOCs, the trouble with MOOCs was that they gave no credit, you know. So uh, it was great, great courses, very large courses, very high attrition, only single digit survival rate. Because, uh, you know, there was no credential, there were no credentials. You uh, very determined people that wanted to, to learn could, <laughs> but 7% finished the, the MOOC, you know, 100,000 started, 7,000 finished. So. The idea is, that, and but students, they want degrees. They want, you know, and that also uh, incentivize them to study. Uh, and because if you take a MOOC and you have uh, the smallest difficulty, the smallest challenge in life, in work, with the family, or at home, uh, you drop out. <laughs> and that's what happened. So I like the idea. And that's, uh, and, and then there was a process. Uh, you know, I was only the dean. You know, dean, you're in the university, you know. <laughs> The dean cannot tell the faculty you do X. They will laugh him or her out of the room. Uh, I uh, organized a, a task force to, to learn it. And actually, I didn't interfere with them. I told them, you don't want to do it, we won't do it. The I wanted the faculty to want to do it. But I didn't interfere. My senior associate dean, who is now the dean, Charlie Isabel, we didn't intervene. 
they led it uh, they, they, for six months. The town hall, Sebastian came. I came when they invited me, but we did not interfere. And after six months, they voted uh, 75%. They decided to do it. And plus, they developed a, a plan, you know, and the most important part for everybody, for them, for the task force, for the faculty, and for me, was quality. To have a top quality program. Actually, the same one that is on campus. No, not at all different. Same requirements, the same difficulty, no discounts. And they did it. And then there were another two months where we needed approvals, both of regions to the, of the University of Georgia, you know, all the bureaucratic. Uh, but but when, when, when they approved, in, 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 in September 2012, I... Uh, 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 the Board of Region approved it in May of 2013. Uh, we embarked on uh, creating the first five courses uh, and already announced that in January 2014 we will start. And uh, we started <laughs> with five courses and 380 students. That was a start. Uh, since then uh, it grew, grew immensely. Actually, we don't, the sky's the limit, we don't see it. Uh, how large it will become. I can tell you a bit more if you want to know. Oh, absolutely. We want to know more. So first of all, clarification. You said no discount. No, no, no. So does that mean... No a... discount in the academic requirements. Correct. Ah, okay. Uh, actually, <laughs> there are four distinguishing features for our program. The first that it's MOOC-based. You know, we, initially it was the first program that was based on MOOCs. Now they're followers, so it's not unique anymore. The second that caused an earthquake was the price. The cost for the whole program was less than seven, actually sixty-four, sixty-six hundred dollars The whole program. And you pay by a course, 10 courses. So you pay by a course. So it was highly affordable. That caused an earthquake. That was the thing that attracted everybody's attention. So these are the first two features that distinguish it. So the, it's highly affordable. That's why that's a big part of its attractiveness. But the quality also. So, yeah, the quality is just the same. No discount yes. on quality. Um, so, so the affordability. Now, can you give us an idea of what it would cost a person before uh, it, 2013, uh, 2014 no, no, no. when you started? To, to go to, to Georgia Tech to yeah, get a it, master's it, in computer it science. It's, uh, it depends if you are resident or non-resident of the state of Georgia. If you're, okay, if you're a resident of Georgia, like $20,000. If you're a non-resident, it costs $42,000. If you do it in, okay, so $20,000 $20, to get the entire degree. master's degree, and now you only pay $6,000 yeah, or $7,000. Right? It's now $7,000 or 200000 Okay, uh, so so it, it's a third of the price. It's over seventy thousand. Okay. Wow, that's amazing. So um, you said it's over seventy thousand if in a private university. Uh, oh yeah, in a private university, it's a lot. And there it costs yeah, out I, of I, state I uh, something like forty forty two thousand dollars. Yeah, but for an in-state person, you're still saving. Uh, you know, uh, one two thirds of the cost, and for an out of state person, you're saving five sixths yeah. of the cost, roughly. Um, so that is why you created yes. an earthquake. Uh, so, so what have ha what has happened to the normal program? Oh, well, surprise, Tech? surprise! It didn't cannibalize the normal program. Actually, in the first That's five amazing. years, I don't have the up to date numbers. Applications more than doubled. The, wow. the, answer, the explanation of, is that uh, the online program is uh, more than half residential, with uh, domestic, domestic students. The, uh, the on-campus students, the face-to-face -face classes, that's uh, international. Because they don't want only uh, to, to get the degree, they want to get into the States which the uh, online okay, uh, wow. program doesn't enable them. That is so 
Unexpected. I would have predicted the exact opposite. So you're saying that half of the people who take the online no, 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 course are full percent. Sixty-four no, right percent now, of the people when who take we started, the online class it was eighty-seven. But right now, sixty-four percent of the people who take your online class to get their masters in computer science are from the yes. United States. And when people come to Georgia Tech to get a computer science masters, they are. More than half from yes. overseas. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Roughly, roughly wow. fifty-five percent. Right now, in our master degree on campus, there are fifty-five percent. Wow, international. That is so surprising. I would not. I would have guessed it would be the opposite. Also, way around. it was so, not a little uh, bit unanticipated. Yeah. Um, so, because of that, you you use that as an explanation for why your online program didn't cannibalize your residential program. And your your reason is that the people who are coming to the residential program, at least 55% of them, want that um, excuse to yeah. come to the United States on a It's a foot in the visa. door. Foot in the door. Okay. So that no, makes a lot of sense. Now, did, you know, the other, the other yeah, of course, there's, say it's there's a lot it's a several reasons, but I, I believe this is the main one. Interesting. So um, now, did you hear about other programs in the United States losing people because yours is so cheap and you get a degree that's just as good and just uh, as high no. quality? Uh, but we, we don't okay. know. We, we don't know. But frankly, computer science is the hottest field. It's the hottest field. Let's and you're providing a way uh, all this increase because the, the increase of the size of uh, our, our program is called OMSCS, Online MS Degree in Computer Science. OMSCS, that's the name of the program. OMSCS has grown every semester. It, uh, this month it's a seven year old. Every year it grew, every semester it grew. And actually, uh, in the fall, we passed 10,000 students. Uh, in the spring, we passed 11,000. And we now have the applications, and also the number of applications is going up every semester, except, you know, fall and spring is different. The, the application for the fall is usually higher because that's a normal starting point. So if you compare fall to fall and spring, spring to spring, every fall it went up, and every application to the spring it went up. Right now, applications for next fall not finished, but at the same level of last year, which was the record, we are 10% higher. So uh, we, we may reach 15,000, may, maybe even higher. I, I, I cannot predict, but it's still growing. It, it has grown every semester. Wow, that is so incredible. So just to put it in perspective, what is the largest computer science master's program in the world uh, that's we, residential? Uh, we don't know. We don't know. What was your program? program? Somebody said to me, but I think it's only a conjecture. I don't, I don't think anybody went to check it, that our program is the largest master program by a top-ranked university in the world in any area, online or not online. Uh, so, wow. uh, but... It's one of the largest. I don't know. I don't. I don't make any claim because I, I don't. I, I didn't put the time to verify that claim, and I'm not sure he knows what he's talking about. Okay. Any well, other either way. Besides? Yeah, eleven thousand students that are currently enrolled. Uh, that's. Is it a no, one no, year no, or two year program? That's everybody. This is now enrolled in different stages. So, uh, uh, they, they finish yeah. in different periods of time. The most, yeah. Right, but how long is it sort of set up for if you wanted to do it kind of fast? Like, what you would know, be the general? On campus, if you do really, really fast, it's one year. I think in OMSCS, okay. there were few, very few that finish in two. Usually, they finish in three. Because they take okay. one course, usually. It's Georgia Tech, one of our brands is difficult, really difficult. So, a uh, and our students usually have families, have jobs. Uh, to, taking two courses is quite something. So, so actually, the average is one point three courses. So, a big majority take only one course. And, and they uh, have to take ten. Not insignificant minority takes two, and very very few takes two. 
Okay, so uh, you're saying that they they have to take yes. ten courses yes. to graduate, and you can uh, you can take courses in the fall or also spring. Also summer. Right? That's That's summer. Yeah. Also oh, summer. summer. Oh, okay. During the summer, we don't have all the options. Not all the courses are offered. But there is a summer, sure. which includes many of the courses. Which, by the way, we okay, started so with five person... courses. We now have over fifty. Wow, but you just have yes, to take 10 uh, to graduate. According and, to uh, some so. specification. So we have, we have specialization. Yes, of course. Of course. It's like an age. Yes, absolutely. I, I can imagine. So so basically what you're saying is that to get done in a year, you'd have to take no, no, three you take, you, every uh, every single period. Uh, in uh, a year, three classes. usually uh, uh, they, they take four, four, and two in the summer, or five and five. You know, but online, nobody can okay. do it. Nobody does Nobody does. Nobody does. Okay. Very, well, very interesting. Yeah. So when you when you say that there's eleven thousand people currently enrolled, you can kind of think about it as having about three or four thousand people per year, right? Is that how many people kind of come in number per of year? Students that started in the fall term. I bumped into it yesterday, so I can tell you it's a little bit of over twenty nine hundred. So it's almost three thousand. Almost three thousand, and then of course you get some in the springtime. You get you get some in the spring yes, time too, yes, right? Yes, yes, uh, but it's a smaller. Usually, okay. uh, the spring it's the not the natural start. Usually, so, uh, right? It's, it's, so it's a little so bit smaller. To the fall, it's always smaller. Okay, but you get three thousand in the fall and some more in the spring, and that's what builds up the eleven thousand yeah, that you have. But you right have also now. people graduate. And so so far, we graduated almost five thousand right. students. And by the way, the eleven thousand are more than twenty five percent of the students of Georgia. Of all, all the, the students, students at Georgia, Georgia Tech? Tech. Wow, <laughs> that's a pretty impressive a number. So now kind of looking back on all the things that you just said, is you've had a huge career. You've, had a, you've been at Columbia, you've been president at uh, you know, a university. Is creating this program one of the things that you're most proud of and the thing that you know, really makes your career feel like it was really a great career? Not one of the things. The thing. This is wow. the biggest thing I've ever done. Wow, that is so can cool. Look me up. I, I had a pretty good career as a scientist. But, the, but this impact uh, is the biggest thing that I, I never dreamed of. And it's, it could change the way everything is done. But obviously, computer science is probably the yeah, easiest it's the most subject natural. It's the to most teach natural. online. It's the most natural. Okay. Uh, partly because uh, the technology comes from there. Partly uh, because, in some sense, uh, immediate interaction is somewhat less important. Uh, though many areas, and I recommend places to try all areas. You know, never say never. Never say this area you cannot do it. Try. And try to solve it. And technology improves all the time. So maybe even you cannot do it now. Next year you may be able to do it with some additional technology. Mm -hmm. That's I, that's exactly what I think. So I teach physics. And of course, during the pandemic, we couldn't have laboratory classes. So we found a little special device that we could mail to each student. And it had all the ways to... You know, test I mean, laws of gravity. Lecture, and like I'm a, a big supporter of... Uh, virtual labs because they you cannot be poisoned and nothing can is explode. <laughs> that's that's a good point. That's a good point. Well, um, is there anything else that you sort of want to talk about that might help, let's say, a younger person follow in your footsteps to do something that is as impactful as creating this uh, program at Georgia Tech? Is are is there any things that you think helped? you be successful? I mean, to my mind, it was like you gave the professors at Georgia Tech autonomy. You didn't interfere. Yeah, yeah. You said, you guys are the task force. Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. their decision, and you cannot tell them what to do. You know, you are a faculty. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. But, but that was probably one of the key things that you could pass on to somebody else. Say, hey, if you're going to try to start something big, when you make a task force, let yeah, them make the It's kind of bottom up. So he, even if it's your idea, it has to be their idea. <laughs> you have to be to a little bit backtrack. You have to be, go back 
and let them. And they wanted to do it. They, 75% voted to do it uh, because they were excited about the innovation, about being the first. Uh, so, and I cannot, you know, I'm totally indebted to them. The, you know, there was this joke about and Eisenhower were... coming to Colombia and telling the faculty, you know, you, the faculty, when he was president, you, the faculty, are the employees of the university. So, I, I, Rabi, Nobel, you know, I, Rabi, a Nobel laureate in physics, said, Mr. President, I apologize, but I have to correct you. We, the faculty, are not employees of the university. We are the university. <laughs> oh, and I, I believe strongly in it. Yes, faculty yes, to absolutely. want to do it. Of course, academic leader sometimes know how to direct, suggest, and sometimes backtrack. They don't, I told them, you don't want to do it, you won't do it. You know, I, I, I will not force you, I will not corner you, and, uh, and, uh, but it, it, it will be your decision. And, and these uh, people on the task force, were they all from uh, computer yes. science? Uh, were yes. they all faculty in computer science? Um, and did they, like, stop teaching the no, regular no, no. classes? It, everybody and, that okay. teaches in OMSCS, it's extra work and extra pay. Not okay. big, but not okay. insignificant. Cool. Uh, hmm, interesting. Uh, so they, well, have, they have some additional income. Uh, actually, uh, which has three yeah. pieces, but I won't get to. If you want, I can. Uh, with you. Yeah, I, I, I think we'll leave that off in case people feel a little weird. You talking about their salary, but, but I feel like uh, you know that's an important piece of why it worked because people who are university professors are often, in my opinion, as a university professor, a little bit underpaid compared to our uh, counterparts yeah. in they, the industry. They won't double the salary, but they get a. a and, and in business schools, usually when they teach executive MBAs, they're very richly paid. They, but, they, but it's a, a decent addition. It was the why. Uh, because I yeah. also am a strong believer in incentives. People may really do voluntarily right, so once or twice, or maybe if they are non-tenured three times, but uh, you cannot count... And you cannot sustain a big effort without compensation. Well, and with 11,000 students paying, you know, on average, uh, like $600 per course, right? Uh, taking 1.3 courses per semester. That's, you know, that's no, enough no, money they, to now, give Georgia the Tech incentives. Now gets, and there is some sharing between the, the various units that are involved. Uh, I, I don't know the exact number, like six million dollars a year. So, so it's uh, it's it brings uh, that's the after the net, you know. So after all the expenses, <laughs> including uh, so wow. you know with this large number, even though the tuition is small, uh, you multiply it by a large number, it's still pretty good. Yeah, that that's great, and and it didn't happen overnight. I mean. You, Georgia Tech had to invest we in were it lucky. To, we to be able were lucky. You know, doesn't have to have luck. Uh, so the initial uh, cooperation collaboration was with Udacity with Sebastian Strand. That the New York Times says a, a great physicist called Jim Gates. I'm not sure you you know him. Uh, he is a presidential medalist. He was quoted saying that we are the right brothers. And I said, no, 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 we are the wrong brothers. Uh, not because we invented the airplane, but be because we will actually show whether the MOOCs can fly. And we did. So Sebastian Tran collaborated a brother. He's, uh, we call one another brothers. But then we also went and got AT&T into the picture. And we went to AT&T, actually directly to the CEO of AT&T at the time, Randall Stevenson, together with number two, uh, Bill Blaze. And we went to him on a Friday, January 5th, 11, before even the faculty voted. On Monday, he gave us $2 million. He liked the idea. And a year later, he gave us another $2 million. 
So wow. without, they were crucial. They were crucial. Georgia Tech is a public university. Its endowment is about 5% the endowment of Harvard. <laughs> if they had to invest $2 million, I'm not sure they could do it. They could do it. That was, I didn't realize so, it at the time, but that was crucial. So, create, so the reason that... Create a course cost us $300,000, each course. Now we are better. Wow. Uh, it's about $100,000, $120,000. But each course, wow. we, had a, we needed this $2 million. So we, in the first two years or so, or three, because of this twice $2 million, we were in the black. And we didn't have to invest. We were always in the black because this wonderful support by AT&T, and people ask me, what did they get for it? They didn't get anything. But they sent many of the, uh, the employees, and they didn't get any special treatment. You know, we, we dealt with them as, as any candidate for, you know, applying. You know, they had to have the requirements. Uh, the fact that they were from AT&T didn't help them. Interesting. So, wonderful. And, and I was going to say, the fact that Georgia Tech became the first to offer this and not Harvard with its huge endowment is really because of one thing, Zvi Gali, right? I mean, Galil, you are the man. You're, you're the guy who had the vision. You I, said, I have, you said, I have it, it, a big part in it, but it's the faculty. <laughs> you know, it, it's well, the faculty, but you, and my you associate, helped them. Senior associate dean, Charles Isbell, who is now the dean. There were two, some other important people, so I won't mention all of them. But Charles also, when Charles is amazing, he has taught two courses in the program and still as Dean teaches them. I as Dean wow. didn't teach any that course. that is amazing. He, every <laughs> semester, I'm not sure summer, but fall and spring, he teaches two courses. Of, of course, it's easier because the, the classes are recorded, you know, but he's still instructor of record. And That's he developed really the cool. courses together yeah. with somebody from Brown. That's what you can do. You can do, have faculty from all sorts of universities. Uh, but right. he teaches, uh, the guy from Brown, Brown, a uh, great guy, Michael Littman, long gun. Charles is teaching every semester two courses. And the students love him. So, so how does Brown feel about taking away yeah, no, one no. of their... That was an extra, you know, you know faculty can consult. A, a, a university does not own their free time. So uh, I don't think, I'm not sure what he did with Brown. Maybe he asked her permission. I don't know. Uh, but that was uh, way back when they, like five, seven years ago, when they, when they developed the course. Interesting. That is so fantastic. Um, so, you know, looking at the pandemic, do you think that creating these MOOCs in 2014 prepared Georgia Tech to be better than other universities in teaching computer science when the pandemic hit? Uh, okay. So kind of tell us about that. You know, a, a pandemic is, of course, horrible. That nobody wanted it, and it's awful results. But there are some silver, silver lining. So when the, you know everybody moved to online, so did Georgia Tech. But we had fifty something courses ready, ready to go. We use them also. By the way, the. Tapes are used also by their own camp. They have access, you know. So, so, so people who take it on campus and go to classes or don't go to classes, they can use the tapes also. Usually, the professor use them. It's another resource for them. But we we were ready to go. <laughs> and, 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 and how universities what were forced to move to online with no experience whatsoever, and it was quite rocky, uh, you know. Uh, but you know. People suffered, but that was it. That was it. We had these fifty-something courses in excellent shape, and now the result of the pandemic: uh, some, not all, some that move to online will use much more online, or not necessarily in full, but maybe in part, because you can combine, you can have hybrid, and change the mode of your teaching. And probably that's a very unlikely case that. Uh, you know, because to have a, a talking head talk to them and everybody writing, uh, if you have it on tape, <laughs> uh, it, it's much more efficient. 
So you're, what you're saying is that the people who normally taught in person, who had to teach online because of the pandemic, didn't just do a talking head. They let the students watch the no, taped no, it's version. It's complicated. I, I don't get into the, all the details, but they, we have some modes of interaction. You know, it's MOOC-based, but it's much more advanced than the old online old online where somebody just recorded in class, you know, they're still online and some of them charge the full price. And though there are 40 programs that followed us in 30 universities. The first one was Illinois who called, calls us the big brother. So they have now three different programs and we have three. We, we, we have two others in Georgia Tech. So, and they have three. But they were the first one, but they came and learned everything from us and copied the essentially everything, but admit it. The others even don't know that uh, they copied from us. But uh, uh, many, many, uh, many, but there are now 30 universities that have a much more reduced price, a uh, MOOC-based uh, master degree. And it's interesting that the first two were both public universities. Again, I'm coming back to this question about why not Harvard, why Georgia Tech? Now you're telling me the second one was University of Illinois. They didn't really have you to get them started with the idea. I mean, they came and watched you, but they came and watched you because they must have already had the idea. So what was it that gave no, no, them they, the idea? Did they have somebody they, like you that was interested? Or? So, so they, they already saw us and they left the idea. Uh, the guy there, okay. uh, uh, Raj Echamandi, who is now Dean of uh, Business uh, in Northeastern, but... Uh, uh, he uh, uh, he came here and he called us big brother and we called him little brother. Uh, could be sister, so no gender, please. <laughs> but, you know, when he saw your uh, courses and he said, ah, I want to go down and meet this guy and see how they do this, uh, you you indirectly, you know, convinced him by showing them courses, but he he had a yeah, fertile course, mind that was prepared. And, they did and, and, and they what did was... I am, like iPhone. Lowercase i, MBA, capital. <laughs> like iPhone. They have MBA program. So they were the first MBA program. They, they copied your computer science program they to did, do an MBA did, program. Is that and they're quite successful. They're, they have a small number, thousand of number of students. Uh, nothing compared to 11,000, maybe 3,000. I, I, I don't know exactly. And maybe they also, we accept everybody that we never still kept it. I had some pressures, I won't name names, uh, to, to keep the site, to stop, to stop at 4,000. <laughs> but it was against our principle of accessibility. Our motto is accessibility through affordability and technology. And I can one day say, no, 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 uh, we will accept only <laughs> because Everything in higher education is uh, uh, you get your reputation by denying students. <laughs> by, you know, everybody, uh, you know, Stanford accepts five and a half percent, you know. And they, oh, it's they below five percent now. now. Lately. I didn't follow. <laughs> it it five, maybe two years ago it was five and a half. It's harder and harder. <laughs> and they put it on everything. So they, as a, by oh, denying yeah. people, they feel better, which is kind of upside down world. Uh, my goal was accessibility, and the funny thing that happens is our online program, that's the second, the first one was MOOC-based, the second one, the price, which caused an earthquake, the third one is the admission. So we accept everybody to believe we can do it, and it's about 70%. The on-campus is 10%. And guess what? The people in the online program sometimes perform better. So they are not inferior. <laughs> so this selectivity is, uh, you know, of course, uh, on campus, you have to be selective because you don't have the facilities. You, you don't have the classrooms. Uh, and you don't have the other goodies that you give all the students, you know, <laughs> gym and everything else and, and eating places and dorms. So uh, as I'm not criticizing, but... Uh, uh, but in terms of selectivity, there are much, much more talented students that are rejected, you know, just because you're, you don't have room. So the 70% comparably perform sometimes a little bit better, sometimes a little worse, uh, because we didn't lower the uh, admission uh, uh, requirements. 
because we, the, the role of the admission requirement is to accept everybody that can do it. Wait, wait, wait. So, so let's repeat these numbers. 70% of the people who apply to your online program yeah. get in, okay? And the percentage of people who apply and get into the residential, what was that again? 10%, 10%, and ten percent, the, the, ten and a half. Okay, so you're saying that the the bar for admission is equally high in both no, cases? No, no, no. In, in so, your own campus, you are stricter. That's what I thought. Okay, what, what were you just saying then about we didn't lower the standards? The number for... dictates how many you can allow in. So, of so, course. so we you... probably could have accepted 50% uh, for the on-campus, but we cannot. So you yeah, have to raise the bar, but it's kind of, you're, you're saying it's yeah. artificial. So if you, if you took the bar, what it should be, it would be oh, equal to the online, and, but because of space limitations, you have to artificially raise the bar I, for the I'm residential sure program. And students that apply to Harvard, they accept in the single digit 30, 40 percent that are rejected are excellent students. Absolutely, yeah. Well, so you, I, you I know from personal decide, experience. <laughs> uh, you know, don't don't get down, don't be down, and the process is quite random. You know. You help some old lady mm -hmm. cross the street, you get two points, you know, and then, <laughs> and then I can meet you because well, we, so it, we, we, could, we could go in that direction, but we did a whole interview on a guy who wrote the book, Who Gets In and Why? And he spent three years embedded in three different schools, including Emory University right next to you, uh, to see how they do the admissions process. And he agrees with you that there's oh, a lot of randomness uh, to it. Uh, because of the space limitation. Uh, we need the... Yes. Uh, but then there are all these things that are not exactly fair, like the legacy, uh, the donors, or the potential donors, you know. The Georgia Tech is pretty good. I I'm not say, talking about any other university. Georgia Tech is pretty good. There's a public university. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the process is, uh, is fair. Yes. It's, weird. it's a weird process that we had a whole interview about it. So if, if you're listening to this interview and you want to know more about that, you can check out that interview. But uh, I have just a few more thoughts for you I want to discuss because you seem to have this, this great idea that you can get a Brown professor and a Georgia Tech professor to teach the perfect computer science class in the perfect way. And your model allows for that kind of flexibility. What, um, what will education look like in the future? Could, could we imagine a situation where a student, maybe from international, wants the experience of coming to the United States, wants to be surrounded by people their own age, you know, the, on, a, on a nice campus or a nice place. So instead of, um, you know, doing this at, at, uh, at the schools that already exist, you know, Georgia Tech, Harvard, University of Illinois, Instead, some entrepreneur comes and just rents out a resort and says, let's all go here. And the professors are going to be great professors from Brown University, Georgia Tech, Harvard, anywhere else. And we'll just have it right here. So do you think yeah. that that might be it's a future a of education? Bit, uh, too optimistic that it can happen. Also, in our case, uh, this is essentially the only case where we have two, actually two, the two professors co-teach this class. I told you the, the one that was now Dean is a guy from Brown and they kind of play good cup and bad cup. Uh, or the, the, he asks the question, he answers the question, sometimes they sing. It's, it's a beautiful, if you watch my talks, uh, uh, I, I have a clip, a video clip from the class. So, because they are good teachers and also quite entertaining. Um, that, that sounds fantastic. But why couldn't that happen? Why, why couldn't Potentially, yes. and, I have a friend, and, uh, he taught online and not online at Columbia. Uh, 40 years after, he got his PhD at Columbia. And he uh, he basically won already 30 years ago that, uh, that maybe one day when we, we did online, and we did online at Columbia when I was dean, we did it in the in the, in the normal way of, of that I told you, and not in so top way, and charge the full tuition. Uh, he said that one day, uh, actually, we will need much fewer teachers because we can get the p best teacher in the world for every course. Yes. yes. But you also need that personal attention. So maybe you can have the best oh, teacher, course, but then also 
and that's somebody the there of, to yeah, help you we, work that's, These are the parts we are trying all the time to enhance, you know, the engagement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, you know, online. So, uh, but... It, well, in the, in, in the last few minutes that we have, can you just tell us, since none of the people watching this show have probably been through your course, what makes it better than the old-fashioned taped courses that's just me talking, you know? What makes it more interactive? What have you done? It, it cost you 300000 to make each course. What well, did you do to make it so interactive? Console, we have Piazza. Piazza is a system where students can interact. Now... In our case, and that's the third, uh, I told you the three di distinguishing, MOOC-based, price, admission. Uh, and there are some other details in the admission that are somewhat different. I, I won't get into them. But that's the fourth thing that's unique to our program, the use of social media. So there are 70, not, maybe now more, of student groups. <laughs> and they interact on social media give advice, uh, some of them by course, some of them by gender, uh, some of them by place. Uh, the one from Shanghai, you know, they have some of them by gender, you know, the, the, the women, women uh, group. Uh, not sure we have minority groups, they might be. Uh, but there are 70 plus, uh, uh, and I think all of them, most of them are still active, and they interact, they help one another, they even give advice to potential students. <laughs> and we developed kind of the community, which is part of the amazing part. And many of our OMSCS students TA. And they get peanuts. They, they TA, and, they, they and some of them TA after they graduate. Some dozens of them, some. We need a huge number of TAs. We have TA for every 50 students, on campus for every 30 or 25. But, but for every 50 students, you need to grade this, you know. We, can, we cannot automate the grading, you know. And, it, and we don't give only uh, four choices questions in exams or, or homeworks. Sometimes projects, you know, you need to grade things. But they volunteer for little pay because they, somehow they love the program and give back. And actually, without them, mm, we won't be able fabulous. to do it. So... Almost all our yes. on-campus students are TA in here, the master students. <laughs> uh, but we need, if you do the computation, 11,000 uh, uh, divided by 50 is, uh, I don't know, it's more than that because everybody takes 1.3 courses. So it's 14,000, 15,000 divided by 50 is 280. So you need 300 TAs. <laughs> That is amazing. Well, um, it is it is incredible. I guess we'll just have to go and watch the taped videos. Are are they shorter than the old fashioned ones? Are they like done no, in no, little no. bits I, with tests? And yes things? and no. <laughs> the MOOCs. One of the properties of the MOOCs, which distinguishes them from the old online, you ask about the differences, is that a it's this, the class is the same time frame, maybe seventy five minutes. But it's broken to five, six pieces. And every piece uh, has a quiz. <laughs> so that, that mm -hmm. they make sure that the student understood the, con uh, the concepts, you know. So, so it, it has breaks and quizzes. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. and the, but, but it's usually, we uh, put it, uh, the class is in the same semester, so in, initially, if Sebastian that uh, always had, had, has had uh, wild ideas like the self-driving cars, uh, he's, I think, the first one that had the idea, uh, uh, say, oh, we, they can have any time. We don't have to live by semester. But the people in our administration almost got a cardiac arrest. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, you need to handle them. Different semester, different time, somebody comes three years later. No, no, it's a, we cannot do it. So we did it by the semester. So the things inside is flexible, but also not entirely flexible because there are deadlines for homeworks, deadlines for exams. But in, in between, it's flex, totally flexible. And plus, they can watch the class from the beginning to the end if they want because they get all the tapes right away. Yeah.
That's great. So, so these 75 minute lectures are broken into five or six pieces, 10 minutes each, and there's a quiz after it. And that's what makes it a little bit more interactive than the old fashioned the taped lectures. Trip. But then they have office hours. Uh, they can meet the TAs, they can meet the, the professor, and they interact between themselves. Uh, and and actually, we are we also fortunate right now. There was a, a superb executive director that is not now anymore because he did other things. Now he does only the, the top thing. His name is David White. Uh, but David Joyner there is is now executive director, and his research is in computational technology. So he's experimenting in all sorts of things. So first of all, he introduced a, a lab so people can do research. Because usually our master students have one option to do research. Initially, we didn't do it. Very hard to scale, but now we do some. We do much more. If before research or thesis or on big project, it was only available to on-campus students because very hard to scale. But now the research is a, so we allowed in few cases, you know, people, not unofficially, but now there are much more possibilities. Plus, uh, one great. of the courses so, now experimenting with synchronous. So they can have, uh, but it's hard with a thousand students in the class. So we're, we're trying with the 200 in the class. But uh, uh, so one of the meetings every week for this one course is synchronous. So they can interact, you know, like we're interacting now. Mm -hmm. And is there one professor yes. of that course? There's a, there's a bunch of and, and what? And, and are the TAs there during that synchronous time to meet with people in smaller yeah, groups and then they all the, come back you together? Make it to, to small groups, yeah. Yeah, but okay. very interesting. It, so it's now, it's not part and parcel yet. It's, it's an experiment. We, we try. It's an experiment with 200 you students. You do something so. new, you experiment and learn what you can or cannot do. And what you cannot, never say never, you know? So, so this has just been so much fun for you to do and fun for me to hear how it all went. I can only imagine that you're just going to keep working on this until you can't work on it anymore. I mean, this is, this is it, right? You, you have no plans except for to keep I, this going. Is that, is that the, true? My first three years uh, as a dean emeritus, I'm on the faculty and I teach. But I'm also an executive advisor to online learning. So... But I'm still a kind of global ambassador. I, I gave 76, uh, you are number 76 or 7, uh, uh, talks about it uh, in 16 countries. In March, uh, I will give a webinar and I will give a keynote uh, in ICE Information School uh, conference about it. So uh, still there is big interest seven years later. And I am an ambassador and I'm very involved and I'll do everything, but you know, the leadership in the college have to want me to do it. So, but uh, they, they do. <laughs> well, at Georgia Tech, at Georgia Tech they do, but not yeah. everywhere else. So hopefully you can get the message out to other universities so that they can yeah. become the little yet, brothers. It hasn't <laughs> happened yet. I won't mention the name. One university almost happened because there are universities that cannot offer a master degree in computer science. They, they're kind of limited, but they could use other hours. Plus, maybe somebody there to to manage it, you know. Uh, so people will be on campus, but they will use our tapes, our problems, and and then uh, as we will do with the students, we will not charge them a high price. So we want it to be used. That's great! Wow, that would really get the the you know, the vision you had to have other schools using your tapes, your program, and spread it to more than just the 15,000 students that you're projecting will be in your program, get it out to the other programs around the world, and it could be in the hundreds of thousands. And it could. You know, I, I don't know, because, you know, faculty are funny people, and NIMBY, and not in my backyard, or, and with that university, actually, the computer science department wanted it. It's a very, very big, maybe the biggest university in the U.S. I won't mention names. And they, they were very interested, but then it went to the Senate, and they said, no, 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 no. It doesn't reflect yeah. good or well of us.
Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I wish you the best in that endeavor because the more universities that can use your stuff, the better, or can, if they can develop their own, that's great too. But you know, why reinvent the wheel if you guys have already done it for computer science? So anyway, I wish you all the best. I hope this uh, interview continues to spread your message about this amazing project. And thank you for spending the it time with It was a pleasure. As you see, I love to talk about it. I love to spread the word. I love for people to know about it. And whoever invites me to talk about it, it doesn't have, he or she do not have uh, to ask me twice. So uh, you saw that I talked <laughs> about it with pleasure and I appreciate your interest. Well, thank you, Professor Galil. We really appreciate it. Thank you.